Hello, I'm Mary Clater from the Department of English at the University of Kansas. I'm here to welcome Lily Ledbetter, groundbreaker in women's equality and pay equity. She is here to participate in the Jana Mackey Distinguished Lecture Series. So Lily, what is it that really prompted you to get involved in this truly groundbreaking work? What prompted me in the track in the road of, uh, that I chose to go down uh, was the fact that I grew up in a time that I felt like that there were bigger things out there and there were bigger things for me as a female, even as a teenager going to school. And it all started with some teachers I had. Not that they encouraged me to go into other uh, professions than teaching or nursing or secretary, but it was that I could achieve anything that I set my mind to. And I just knew that women were capable of achieving more than those three occupations that was expected of us. And the doors were beginning to open. They had not opened, but you had to sort of beat on them and go through them, and it wasn't easy. The first uh, assistant manager's job I held, uh, I was demoted once because uh, my boss said, I don't really want you on the road driving from city to city at night and worrying about you. And I said, well, you don't have to worry about me. That's my job. And he said, no, I worry about you. You're a woman out there at night driving on dark roads from city to city to deliver machinery or equipment or whatever, and I got demoted back to being an office manager from being an assistant manager, and he gave my job to a man. And I thought right then, I am going to get my position somewhere, somehow, sometime. And then being the district manager for H&R Block later, I realized that Goodyear had uh, opportunity for women opening up. And so I started pursuing that job, and that was extremely difficult because they had had so few women ever in that position, and none of them had ever survived it, not for any length of time. They either would later uh, take another job or go back to their old job. And, but I made up my mind that I, that's what I wanted, and that's what I started at. And it was really, really difficult because uh, there was a lot of uh, sexual harassment, a lot of abuse, a lot of propositions. And I filed a charge in the early 80s on sexual harassment. My boss told me that if I didn't sleep with him, I wouldn't have a job. Well, I saw in my mind those college tuition bills in my house, my mortgage payment was due, the car payments were due, the insurance on the cars were due, we had a big dental bill. I couldn't quit, and I could not lose my job, and I was not going to sleep with him. <laughs> if I called in overtime from night shift, being on the night shift, the women always answered the phone, and they wouldn't let their husbands come in because they thought they must be having an affair because they had never heard about a woman being at Goodyear. And that was an uh, obstacle to overcome. And so finally I figured out, well, I'll have the janitor to call and then I'll ask when the person gets on the phone. So we got around it that way. So there's always a way around it. And today there are so many opportunities for young women out there. The doors have never been opened and no one has ever attempted to go through. We are still down in the Congress in Washington. There are so few women in politics. There are so few women on corporate boards. There are so few women heading up large corporations. It is still front page news. Now, my job that I went after at Goodyear is a fantastic job for a female. It, you shouldn't even know the difference between a female or a male in doing that job. If you're organized, detailed, and can learn it, and good with people, then it's a great job. And it's not any different than any other job, being an office manager or working at Goodyear in a management position. And we should be given those opportunities, the women minorities, because it's just a better way. And a lot of the employers, the corporations today, are realizing 
that if we incorporate the women and the men together, we have a stronger, better company, and we will be number one either in the service or the product, whichever. Some of the issues that I have found to be the ones that have been most prominent in my personal life are the ones that are involved with women's rights. How do you manage to balance both family and kind of having a political career and just balancing all of that, especially when you were younger, um, and just making sure that you have time for your career in there as well? It, it is hard. It is hard. There's just not enough hours in the day, but it's having that organization that and it's a total family uh, operation in order to meet all goals and when I was working long hours in the six years that I worked two full-time jobs my husband didn't have a real big heavy load at work and so he picked up the slack with the children so this through organization and planning and, and it, it is hard but and I believe that employers once they realize that their choices and their uh, promotions and obligations at work should be based on a person's uh, qualifications, education, experience, and the job performance, no longer about sex, if it's a woman versus a male, or the color of the skin or the nationality of the person. It, this company will do better. And a lot of companies today are going that way. It's, it's growing and it's being realized amongst the companies as well as the individuals. But I want to tell you that hiring in in a male-dominated factory in a male-dominated job where white males had always been the management people on the floor that the people were accustomed to working with is not easy. In fact, the plant manager said, we women should not be in the factory because we just make trouble. I think that you inspire so many women nowadays, and I'm just wondering if there's someone that you looked up to or someone that has mentored you throughout all of this. Oh, absolutely. I had, first of all, was my mother, not that she was highly educated or ever held a job outside the home, but she was such a hard worker and she was so organized at home, and she wouldn't let me slack off. And so that's what gave me the stamina to have the perseverance to do what I've done in the last few years and withstand all of the hardships that went along with standing up. And also, I have had people in my life that I looked up to that I've never met. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt is one of my all-time heroes. Uh, alive today, I would say Hillary Clinton and Michelle Obama. They have such high standards and they give back so much. But what happened to me, I was that ordinary citizen living the American dream, my head down, raising my family, working all the overtime I could get to try to support my family, not knowing that I was being shortchanged in my earnings. And this is not right. Is it easier in a way to address the issue of pay equity when not everyone has jobs and people are struggling to make ends meet? It's hard, but th there are the good jobs out there. Mm -hmm. There are good employers that offer all of these extra things for family life because they realize that people do have families. They do have a life outside of work, and but it is hard. And I tell individuals, you may not live in the location you want to live in, but you can find these jobs. And don't settle for less, because when you start out underpaid, you can never catch up, and it's gone for the rest of your life. We still have employers today that tell women, well, I can't pay you what I pay Joe because he has a family. And a single person is a family. They're trying to live and pay their own rent or their mortgage and pay bills. So it, it's, this is not right. That's not what you base pay on or responsibility. It's based on the responsibility of the job and the experience that the person is bringing and the job performance. What do you think about taking gender equity to a larger global position? I'm working on it. Okay. I'm working on it. <laughs> the first invitation I had after the bill was signed into law was to Rome, Italy. 
and they have the same problem we do, except it's worse. But this is international. I thought in the beginning that this was just a deep southern problem because, as you can tell by my accent, I've never lived anywhere else. And I thought that the good old white guys down south was just keeping control. Well, it wasn't like that. This is international as well as globally and, and all over the United States. I started immediately after the verdict came out in my case, getting letters from all over the United States with other people having lawsuits. And, one of, and two of the large employers in my area, besides Goodyear and the steel plants, uh, was uh, military bases. We have two at the time. And everybody said, well, why didn't you work civil service? And a lot of people said, well, that's why I worked civil service, because I knew that my promotions and my pay was exactly correct. That's not true. I have a whole box of lawsuits at my house that have been mailed to me that are done by government employees. I have a lady in Chicago right now I'm working with. She sued her employer. First, she just asked for help. And with that, she lost her job and she worked for the government. And then she sued them and she's still fighting her case. She ran out of money, but she started representing herself and got some help from another agency, and, and I don't know how she's doing, but this is not just in the South. It's all over the United States and worldwide. And the other countries are even more desperate. And when uh, 09, when I went to Rome, Italy, they had so much hope in the fact that the president had just been elected, Obama had, and he had signed the Ledbetter bill that he would do other things that would help them in their country as well. I've gotten my hands in so many things in so many areas, and uh, one of the things that I want to see next is paycheck fairness pace in Washington. I was there the last two times it was voted on, we failed by two votes. The Republicans blocked it. All the Democrats voted for it. And what I talk about, and what I'm talking about here tonight at KU, it has nothing to do with either party. It is of civil rights. It's an American right. It's a fundamental right that each person is treated fairly. The Constitution states that. And then we have equal pay law in Title VII. And it's right, but we have not achieved it yet. And uh, it's not Republican or Democrat. It uh, belongs to everybody. And that's one of the things I'm so proud of the Ledbetter bill. It was sponsored and co-sponsored by both parties, both Democratic and Republicans. And uh, it was passed and became a law. And that's one of the things that I'm very proud. But paycheck fairness is the next step. And had that been the law, had that been the bill back in my day, I could have found out without retaliation about pay equity and how I stood. And I wouldn't end up in the predicament that I'm in today.